Space Cowboy Books presents Simultaneous Times, a science and speculative fiction podcast. Short stories to stir the imagination by contemporary authors. The Jellyfish from Knoll Arbor by Eric Farrell, with music by Red Blue Black Silver, read by Jean-Paul Garnier. First love has always been the same in Knoll Arbor. Teffy's been told so all her life. Now. It's her turn to experience it. It starts with a stirring sensation, deep within her body. The elongated, gelatinous bulb protecting her tentacles glows purple. Teffy's home planet is nothing but scruff and scab, tough knots of crab grass and silt suffocating in a heavy gas atmosphere. She finds herself totally alone in one of the vast fields beyond the settlements. She knows this is how love always starts. She has to be alone before she's able to feel the warmth in her innards and behold the glow of her bell casting ethereal light. As her parents described it, love is a lens into another world. That love lies latent in one's body, only focusing when the time is right. The purple hue of her ball is her reticule adjusting for its first love. She will soon see through the reciprocating lens to the other side of the cosmos, and that person will see through hers to this desolate place. Where will the other lens lead to? What perspective will shift? The sky above Knoll Arbor is just a static black, the atmosphere too gassy to bear stars. Teffy drips up, up, and up, her tentacles undulating in great burst until she finds herself high above the desolate scrub of her planet. It's best to get in a bird's eye position before the union is complete. That way, the new love of her life will see all her planet has to offer. The jellied, bejeweled towns of Knoll Arbor glint in the distance, awaiting. The union is complete Teffy gains clairvoyance and sees through her new lens of love. Her perspective absorbs that of another, achieving a duality the likes of which she's never experienced. She sees so much more. Perched upon a suburban rooftop in the streets of quiet banality, Teffy witnesses a slumbering humanity. Earth is dark. The outer, family-centric parts of town aren't much to look at. Cookie-cutter houses, sycamore-lined streets, bulbous cars all chitinous and agile, yellow lights through thin living room curtains. Each household its own fascinating social dynamic Teffy will never directly be a part of. Her counterpart has scrambled up a ladder to the roof of a small house. Hardly a teenager, He clicks a little flashlight on and off again, on and off again, always watching his footing. A rugged pair of Converse All-Stars are lashed to his feet, the laces particularly loopy. With his reticule focused, he stands catatonic, his eyes distant, and his vision takes him to the faraway land Teffy calls home. She will never meet this young boy. There is an extremely low chance of her meeting any actual human in her lifetime. Her love will never see her copulate as those within their respective species tend to do, never seek warmth, relief, a soothing voice. What individual species want to do with their bodies is entirely up to them, but this new type of union transcends that. In this union, neither party is able to communicate with the other half. The reticule is the sole component, serving just one extraordinary function. The jellyfish from Knoll Arbor have a gift, and that is their special brand of love. 
Seeing life from a different perspective is as profound an experience as Teffy will ever know. This clairvoyance she's granted will color every future thought she has, making the world she's known on Knoll Arbor seem nearly inconsequential in the grand scope of the cosmos. She remembers when her parents first gave her the conversation about the birds and the bees. Young one, they said, in the undulating den of the family home. She could see through the translucent walls of the house, out at her neighbors bobbing uncertainly in the confines of their own little worlds. Channel your empathy, and your love will let you walk between worlds. Through Teffy's lens, the boy stares out at Knoll Arbor's sparkling towns in the distance. Knoll Arbor was named by an Australian astronomer witty enough to distinguish a gaseous planet of crabgrass by his birthright. Jellied, labyrinthine, the world is utterly strange compared to what the boy knows back on Earth. Plus, his idea of love has been skewed from tripping over the wavering curricula of a backwards world. He doesn't know Teffy's name, nor will she ever know his. Teffy isn't aware her world goes by to people on Earth. From this point on, for the rest of the boy's life, he will always be able to see into her world. The boy will witness Noel Arbor's troubles, the distant planet's ebbing convictions. He will ride the wave's cultural progression and experience each zeitgeist at the pass all from his own humble abode back on Earth. Teffy too will learn to empathize with all Earth is and will ever be. But for now, she is beholden by the eerie quiet of the boy's world. Distant wind chimes from an old craftsman house jingle forebodingly. The boy is barely tall enough to allow her a sight out past the neighborhood to the glittering city beyond. A refinery turns and belches white pasty clouds into the air. Her bulb glows purple as her tentacles wiggle with the mix of excitement and trepidation. The trials and tribulations, the fear of the unknown, the oddity of alien compassion, all tenants of first love her parents had told her about. Teffy, she remembers them saying, first love is always the same. You welcome new energy into your life. You reconcile differences. Through that lens, you grow. She eagerly waits for the future. The pale brightness of suburban city lights creates pools in the streets below. The boy clambers back down the ladder, skipping from pool to pool. She soaks in every image this new lens shows her. But remember, they said, that you will continue to love and grow well past this first love. And you will see that love is infinite. A few months later, in the middle of the night, Teffy awakes to find that familiar rousing deep within her. She glances at her tentacles, sparkling skeins of fuchsia. She will never forget about the boy's world. Now, he is a fully-fledged teenager. She will always be there with him, weighing the perspective of that bizarre blue rock called Earth. He too will always see Noel Arbor. Her whole body quivers in anticipation for the next exotic world she's to peer into. The best part is, the boy will see through this new lens too. Love is not a mere duality. It is multiplicity. It is, indeed, infinite. As the reticule focuses, she smiles and walks between worlds. Apotheosis by Joshua Green, with music by Fog Machine, read by Jean-Paul Garnier.
In five hours, Dr. Harris has lived three lives. The child in front of him will be his fourth. What's your name? He asked, dropping down on one knee. He enjoys children as clients. Their lives are shorter. For the most part, their issues are not a fault of their decisions. Austin, the boy says, smiling as his mother strokes his hair. Well, Austin, says Dr. Harris, looking the boy in the eyes. Did your mother tell you how this is going to work? You're going to live my life? That's right. He points to the black leather couch in the middle of the room. Most therapists would sit you down right there and pretend to care about everything you've been through. All of them ask the same questions and hope for the same sort of answers. I'm different though, Austin. Do you want to know why? Why? He asks. His eyes are wide. Because I actually care. If I don't now, I will. Once you hand over that teeny little device right there, he thuds the boy on the head. It will only be 11 minutes before I've lived your whole life. Then we can talk about our experiences. We can talk about everything we have been through. How does that sound? Dr. Harris waits for the child to respond. He studies his worn and weary face and tries not to think about all the horrible things that might have happened to him. He tries not to be nervous in front of clients. It's unprofessional. Though, deep down, he knows anxiety has already taken root. No one ever comes to him because their life is perfect. I think that would be really nice, the boy finally says. Dr. Harris nods his head. Perfect. The boy is scheduled for surgery in 20 minutes and it gives Dr. Harris some time to look over Austin's file once more. He sits down at his desk and watches as his assistant leads them both out. The surgery itself is highly expensive, invasive, but mostly harmless. He only needs the prism embedded in the malleable circuitry that surrounds the boy's brain. It's an impeccable piece of equipment, able to be installed at birth, useful for anxious parents that feel the need to hyper-monitor their children. Its main use, though, is to record an individual's conscious experience, which can be played at the numerous teleprism playback sites across the globe. His mentor, Tiffany Allen, however, has taken this technology to even greater heights, revolutionizing the world of counseling and therapy. Dr. Harris opens the manila folder and looks at the questionnaire. There's no indication of any sexual abuse, which he's glad for. There's no indication of any sort of physical or emotional abuse by the parents, at least on file. Though he's learned that files hardly tell the truth of anything. He's lived wonders and horrors far too beautiful and terrible to be quantified on three pages of stapled paper. He works his way through the questions and does a double take halfway down the second page. Huh? He says. Lost a father not too long ago? He puts the file down before stroking his beard, losing himself in the white dots of the ceiling. He's lost more fathers and mothers and siblings than he can count. 30? 40? He doesn't know. An aching feeling in his chest grows and settles on his heart. The prospect of losing another father hurts, especially because his biological one is still alive and doing quite well. He rises and opens a door in his office that leads to a teeny, low-lit room. In the center of the room is a small, open pod about three feet high that looks entirely too much like a glorified massage bed. He ducks and lays down before resting his head on the pillow. He's waiting for his assistant to plug him in and it gives him a moment to collect his anxious thoughts. He takes a deep breath, then another. His heart always pounds when he lays down in the pod. He wishes he could liken it to some sort of pumped up feeling, but he knows there is no one to cheer him on. No crowd at the end of the tunnel. He will fall asleep and drift into the dark before awakening as a baby. He will live out this child's experience in real time, experiencing every minute and boring detail. He will be gone for 11 years, though his office will only miss him for 11 minutes. 
This is the worst part, he mumbles to himself. I'm okay, I won't remember when I'm in. He looks over to the right as the door opens. A woman steps in with a small bag in her hands. Inside is a small, bloody prism that houses everything he will learn and experience for the next decade. Are you all ready, Dr. Harris? She isn't smiling. He told her never to smile in this room. His hands are shaking, his breathing shallow. Yes. He closes his eyes. I'm ready. He can feel her approach and it makes his hair stand on end. She sits down behind his head and begins the process of setting the boy's prism in the open slot beside his own, before eventually hooking him up to the pot itself. He doesn't notice when everything switches. He never does. Everything simply goes dark and then it gets bright. Though he is hooked into the machine, his brain processes all that is said from the other room as mumbled words spoken in minutes moan like a wail through a decade of experience. There is no telling when Dr. Harris will begin to remember his explicit experience as Austin. We are two minutes in, which means Dr. Harris has lived a total of two years of your son's life. Wouldn't there be a way to fast forward this? Get to the stuff Austin actually remembers? Common therapy can barely scratch the surface of implicit memory. What we offer is both. We can deal with everything your son explicitly remembers by asking him questions. But how does he feel when he looks at you? Implicit memories are built only by experience, and Dr. Harris will have all of that at his disposal when he comes out. I remember when he turned five, we lost our house in a fire. Austin lost everything, including his favorite stuffed duck. He was so hurt. Will Dr. Harris think I'm his mom? I don't want to think about how afraid he must be, how hurt he is to lose his home. All of his toys burned up. He will have experienced everything Austin has. He will love you as your son loves you, but he's a professional. You have no need to worry. He wakes up alone in the dark. He knows where he is, in the same strange way he knows where he is after a strange dream after a long night. The machine below him pumps and hisses as the mechanical arm is removed from his head. His assistant enters the room and kneels beside him. With sterile gloves, she removes Austin's prism and puts it into a new bag. How do you feel, Dr. Harris? She was told to ask this. He looks around and takes a deep breath. I'm working through grief. Where's the boy? He's waiting for this. She holds up the bag. Fix him up. I'll be out in a moment. He takes a few minutes to compose himself. He thinks of the father they now share. The times he used to take him rock throwing at the lake. The way he held him every Saturday morning as they watched cartoons. Tears stream down his cheeks as he is reminded that he will never, ever get to see him come home from work. It's such a heavy weight to carry, but he's glad that he won't carry it alone. He sees the boy waiting on the couch when he steps back into the room. His heart leaps for his. He knows everything this child has been through. He understands his grief, his love. He knows every secret thought such as his unwavering desire for his mother's approval. He looks to her, too, and it takes everything in him not to swallow her in a hug. He loves her more than the world. How are you feeling, Austin? Dr. Harris asks, sitting in the brown leather chair across from him. I'm talking about surgery, of course. I'm okay, Austin says. His eyes move to the ground. I miss him, you know, says Dr. Harris. I miss him so, so much. He pauses and smiles. Do you remember when Dad took us to the zoo and played catch with the polar bear? Do you remember the bucket that hit the guy in the nose and the blood that went everywhere? Austin looks up and laughs. Yeah, he says, 
We used to talk about that all the time. Yes, we did. Your turn. What? Austin asks. His smile fades. What's something else we can remember together? Austin rubs his hand through his hair. Um, he says, trying to access locked memories. I remember one time Dad brought me home a football, and we played with it in the park for a long time. They talk like this for an hour, reminiscing on the love they both share, Dr. Harris acting more like a surgeon than a therapist in his ability to communicate and understand. They laugh and cry with one another. At one point, Austin gets up to hug Dr. Harris as if he were some long-lost brother. Thanks, Dr. Harris, the boy says. Can we come back again tomorrow? Dr. Harris looks up and tries not to shake. He doesn't want to lose his mom. He's lost so many before. She smiles, though, and simply says, I think we could work something out for next week, honey. I think that would be fine. Dr. Harris tries not to be jealous of the way she speaks to him, of the way her heart hurts for only Austin. He wants so badly to tell her that he needs her, that they need each other after the death of her husband. But all he can do is breathe and smile and hope that the love and pain he feels remains restrained. After they leave and shut the door, Dr. Harris moves to the couch and lays down. He's sweating now and his mind is reeling. Only a moment passes before the tears flow heavily onto the couch. I can't do this, he says. I miss her so much. I want my mom. The boy shouldn't be able to have her like that all to himself. His assistant is next to him in a moment, water in hand. She reaches out and strokes his hair. Shh, she says. Everything is okay. He hopes she means this, and for a moment, he wishes he could live her life to see. He has suffered hundreds of lives for hundreds of others, and in this moment, he feels guilty for thinking of himself, a concept that fades with each passing day. The next morning, he wakes as sunlight pours in through the window next to him. He's not surprised he fell asleep in the client room. Memories of Austin's life come flooding into his mind, but a knock at the door startles him out of his false reverie, his nostalgia for a mother and father he misses so dearly. Come in, he says, letting the sun hit his eyes. He looks and sees his assistant's head poke through the door. How are you today, Dr. Harris? Just fine, he says. It's a lie. What's my schedule look like today? It's Friday, she says. You don't take clients on Fridays, remember? He hates when she talks to him like that. He lived a total of 97 years yesterday, forgetting that it's Friday should almost be expected. So I have my meeting with Dr. Allen? That's right, she pauses. Do you want me to reschedule? No, he takes a deep breath. He doesn't feel like meeting with her today. All week she has been hiding in her office, unwilling to meet with new clients, incessant in her desire to meet with therapists instead. I need to talk to her today. I feel like I'm losing myself. He sits up on the couch and stretches his back. When is my appointment? 20 minutes. Do you need coffee? I'll get it myself. He watches her leave before rising. He makes his way to the coffee machine and looks out the window. He's on the third floor, watching the busyness of the morning. Almost everyone below him works 40 hours a week. Some work slightly more. He's not jealous of their pay, as his is quite good. He's able to send more than enough to his parents and children. What he is jealous of, however, is their apathy. Everyone beneath him can only care so much about the others in their lives. For them, there is an end to empathy, a border, an edge. 
there's a realization that their capacity to care can only extend to the boundary of their own conscious experience. Though for him, there is no limit, only boundless experience, thoughts, love, and loss. Anthony? Dr. Harris turns, smiles, feigns a happy face. He needs her, but he isn't sure his mentor really cares. After living so many lives for so long, it's difficult for him to think others care as much as he does. Dr. Allen, he says. He pours himself a cup before moving to the door. I've told you a thousand times to call me Tiffany. She waits for him to come, then opens the door wide for him to follow. Our session is going to be a bit different today. Is that all right? He stops at the door and examines her face. Today, she seems so tired and so old, as if she has lived eons in a week. He wonders if she has always been like this. He can't quite remember. There are so many memories and thoughts vying for his attention. Are you all right? He asks. She smiles. I'm just fine. They make their way down the hall and into the surgery room. In the middle is a beige bed. Please lay down she says. What are you doing? He asks. Dr. Harris watches as she sits down at the computer at the far end of the room. As you may have heard, she begins, I haven't taken on any new clients this week. She pauses and turns around to face him. Well, I suppose I have if I include the members of our team. That isn't allowed, Dr. Harris says. For our own sanity, that's not allowed. You said that you want us to never doubt our reality. You said that we need to stay grounded in ourselves. His heart quickens as the implications of her suggestion settle on his mind. Dr. Allen sighs and rises from the chair, leaving the computer program open on the screen. You need help, Anthony. You're losing yourself. And there's no way for me to help you unless I step into your reality, into the realities you have lived. There's nothing I can do for you until you allow me to experience all that you have. We're gonna take the day and work through this, Anthony. I'm willing to do this, as I've been willing to do it all No! Dr. Harris screams, slamming his coffee on the table next to him. It all becomes too much for him in that moment, and he feels something in him snap something deep within his mind. You promised that you would never take our prisms, that you wouldn't even ask. Anthony, Dr. Allen says. She takes a step forward. You can't have this, he points to his head before taking a step back. Tears stream down his face, and it takes him a moment to find the door handle as he backpedals towards the door, leaving Dr. Allen alone in a room of memories. I'm done. He says, I have to be done. Sunlight is there to greet him when he tumbles out the door and onto the sidewalk. He stumbles down the street, thinking of everything and everyone that he could be. It hits him then, that at some point in the next few minutes, decades and years, he may very well wake up no longer as Anthony Harris. He wipes his eyes at the thought before eyeing everyone he sees on the sidewalk. Some are looking his way, pretending to care, and others are simply ignoring him. He thinks, then, that he could be any one of these people, and when he turns around to look at the window of his old office, it occurs to him that he isn't Anthony Harris at all, but so many people at once. Apathy is all he feels, and it is unwavering. A car flies by him. He looks to the busy traffic and thinks, for a moment, that he could take one singular step in front of any one of those cars and know for certain. He could know for certain if he was truly himself, Tiffany, or the infinite other possibilities. I could get it removed, he says to himself, wiping his face. He contemplates this as a cloud covers the sun overhead and his one dog barks at another in passing behind him. He has lived this life for so long, 
but lived the lives of others far longer. He has reached the apotheosis of empathy. Determined, and with a smile that feels more withered than true, he takes a step. In this episode of Simultaneous Times, you heard The Jellyfish from Knoll Arbor by Eric Farrell, with music by Red Blue Black Silver, and Apotheosis by Joshua Green, with music by Fog Machine. Theme music by Dane Luscombe. Come visit us at our bookstore in Joshua Tree or online at spacecowboybooks.com. Don't forget to subscribe and visit us on Instagram and Twitter. We'd love to know what you think of the show.